This, anyway. is a, this is the Tibetan old man mask, old mountain man. So as a good, old, I have a bag in which I carry my Vajra and bell in it. So I'm putting it next to me because I like him. He's very nice. It's a very cute bag. Okay, how is everybody on the Kalachakra front? I heard from Michael, I'm sorry I missed it, you know, I, I've been in a little bit of a frazzled mode because I just retired from active teaching at Columbia. And that's a big, I didn't think of it as a big thing because I'm still in the faculty for a little while longer. But it is a big thing, you know, I almost, I felt very sentimental. On my final class of my introductory course, about 70 students, uh, it's dropped down from earlier years due to various things and building up again, actually. But uh, I can't stay, so that's that. And anyway, they, in the last class, they brought cakes. They, they brought balloons to the classroom. And then at the end of the lecture or of the day's class, they informed me that they had planned to spend the day telling me about the different insights that they had had during the year. But then when I started teaching, then they just let me teach. You know? But then I was embarrassed and I said, well, if you told me, I would have I would have stopped and listened to you. And then they said, no, no, we enjoyed the last thing. And what I did was I went over the uh, Man of Peace book. Because the last book that they read was uh, the Dalai Lama's Beyond Religion, Ethics for the New Millennium. And um, so, you know, I, I was showing them the Dalai Lama's own struggle with, with the unethics of the Chinese communists and the whole and the military and the whole thing. And I showed that book, you know, uh, I, I went through some of the pages of it to them and they were really thrilled. And my most fun experience of that party was a young Chinese man, very marvelous one, who plans to be an astrophysicist, he told me on that last day. He had not spoken to me during the, during the semester, but on the last day he was all, he suddenly burst into smiles, especially when he saw the book, the comic book of Man of Peace. And he just rushed up and he said how much he enjoyed the course and how much he learned from it and all this. And then he told me his name, and then I gave him the, the source of his name in the Tao Te Ching, uh, the Book of the Way, you know. And it was wonderful because he looked, he's a very serious student type. And all semester long, he had not really cracked a smile. He was like gung-ho listening, like a very, very, very severe, severe concentration. So that really made my, made my week. On that last day, the, the, the spy from the Confucius Institute didn't show up, who had been attending my early lectures, although maybe I converted him a little bit, I don't know, but he didn't want to come to the last lecture on the Dalai Lama, so he didn't show up that day. Anyway, uh, nice to talk to you all, and I heard from Michael that you, um, you he, he read to you or talked to you about some of the points from different places in my um, essence of eloquence, uh, translation and study of the Dalai Lama's greatest, uh, not the Dalai Lama, Dalai Lama's teacher, Dongkapa, his greatest treatise on emptiness and on the mind-only school, you know, the Vinyanavada school, the consciousness school, and the, and the centrist school. Um, really amazing book. You know, it's called the Iron Bow of Dongkapa, or sometimes called the Golden Book of Dongkapa, because of a vision that Dongkapa had. I don't know if Michael told you that story. When Zongaba was writing another source that you could read, although it wasn't translated by me, so maybe, but whatever, I, I won't go into that, uh, is in the third volume of the three-volume uh, Lamrim Chemel, which I recommend to you all, edited by Joshua Cutler. I wrote one of the uh, forewords, and um, unfortunately I was not part of the translation team due to politics, and, but it's still pretty good. And um, when he was doing the wisdom part of that, the vipassana part of that, laktong part of that, you know, critical insight part of that, um, he was discouraged about it because it's so complex and subtle. And he was going to give up writing it even. He got sort of writer's block. And, and then Manjushri appeared to him, or he had his usual conversation with Manjushri that he used to regularly have. And he said to Manjushri, why am I bothering to write? Who am I writing this for? No one's going to really appreciate this level of subtlety of the people around me in the, in, um, among my students. And, and Manjushri said, who, what are you telling me about who's going to appreciate what? In the future, this will be a great book. You go ahead and finish it. 
and then to encourage him, Manjushri, sorry about my hair, but my everybody won't pull the hairbrushes. Manjushri um, re created a vision in the sky at his retreat house where he was writing that. It was in Reting Monastery, the monastery founded by Domdamba, the disciple of Atisha, who was the first Dalai Lama incarnation of Avalokiteshvara in Tibet, according to the tradition. <laughs> Domdamba, his name. And uh, Layman, actually. <clears throat> Layman. But, uh, but Atisha's principal disciple. And that's what he wrote about Rimchemo. And um, Dongaba did. And then uh, he said, and the, but the letters were in silver. So he looked at all for the months he took writing that, or, or weeks or months. He saw that there with the letters of the 20 emptinesses from the Prajnaparamita Paramita written in silver in the sky, in Sanskrit. And um, then when he wrote Leishi Nimbo years later, about uh, seven years later or something, seven, eight years later, six, seven years later, he uh, saw the same vision came back without a special statement from Mandashi, but the same 20 emptinesses were in the sky, but this time in golden letters, not silver letters. So they're known, that's known as the silver Madhyamaka work of his and the golden work. And then the other great work is the commentary he did on Chandrakirti's Madhyamaka Avatara, Introduction to the Middle Way. And that has been sort of translated uh, too. So those are all worthy of reading. But I'm um, very glad that Michael did that. And uh, I could do another session myself on that book. And I'm more happy to do it now that I retired and I have no one to teach anymore. <laughs> And I'm enjoying teaching you. So what I thought I would do today, just to leave you with it, I'll be away all of January, pretty much. And uh, so I won't be able to make another thing. And although I understand not too many of you are are consulting this uh, work, which I'm sad to say, sad to know. Uh, you know, I guess everyone is very busy, and I hope you're keeping up your sadhana practice, and I hope you will come to the retreat, which is now uh, moved to uh, later in February, I think, during the New Year fortnight, so very auspicious. So um, what I'm going to do uh, today, I think, is I'm going to read from our beloved Vesna Wallace's translation uh, and give some commentary on the Sadhana chapter, just to warm you up, which I think we will look at quite a bit during the um, during the retreat. Uh, and... Um, uh, it's the fourth chapter, you know, because, right, you have the outer, inner, that's the first and the second chapters, then the alternative Kala Chakra, outer Kala Chakra, inner Chakra, then the alternative Kala Chakra are the last three chapters of the, of the, the light Tantra, or a bridge Tantra, and, uh, the, and its commentary, the stainless light, written by Dalai Lama's previous Avalokiteshvara incarnation, the Pundarika, the white lotus, king of, eighth king of Shambhala according to the magical tradition. Okay, so she begins. It's called the Great Exposition. Well, there, each of the Kala Chakra chapters are divided in the commentary to different what are called Great Expositions. And actually, the, 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 you know, that's a, a, a laconic translation because the literal word Udesha means a summary exposition, sort of min, min, concise exposition. But the Great Exposition the great summary exposition on the location, protection, and disclosure of sins, it begins. Because, of course, any sadhana involves a process of purification and of, uh, and, of, and of empowerment or fortification, right? It's the fourth chapter, the initiation, the sadhana, and then the perfection stage. So this is the creation stage. It's three, four, five, chapter three, four, five, or like that. So the, I'm beginning with, these are the verses now by Pundarika, which means Dalai Lama's previous life as a king of Shambhala, in my, in my opinion. I always, when I worked on this editing, these texts, uh, the four chapters that we've done, as I would get into the Sanskrit and the Tibetan of these different chapters in editing uh, the great translations of Vesna Wallace, Jensen Andresen, and James Hartzell, um, uh, last two being students of mine, Vesna not being my student, just a colleague, um, I always hear Dalai Lama's voice coming from Pundarika. It comes just like his voice, I don't know why. Now, the word Bhagavan, which is the name of Buddha, uh, Vesna changed from just using Bhagavan 
to using, at my suggestion, and with the court, the agreement of Alan Wallace, her husband, also a translator, she translated it as Divine Lord, which I think is quite nice, actually, for Bhagavan, because it is like talking to God, you know, when you use the word Bhagavan and you address a Buddha, when you say Bhagavan, you're kind of indicating that uh, a Buddha is, although a Buddha seems to be a human, he's also called teacher of humans and gods, and he's sometimes called the god of the gods. These are all classical names of Buddha, Devati Deva, Purusha Manas, uh, uh, Deva Manasharam, Shasta, and there's something divine about him. You know, he's like, um, I always say, a Buddha um, is like Dr. Spock, in the transporter beam room of the newer generation Star Treks, when he's being beamed out somewhere just before his form disappears with sparkles of light inside his body and the body itself looking kind of vague. I would say that's what Buddha looked like once he was Buddha. Sort of just not an ordinary, in other words, meat space body, a kind of a divine or a Buddhine. If we had a word Buddhine, that would be good, but a meat space body. So there's something very, very uh, divine-like about Buddha. We do use divine. Oh, that's absolutely divine, people say. Oh, how do you like that? Oh, it's divine, you know. Okay. So now I'm going to quote the verses and make a little commentary on them. Uh, Pundarika begins, of course, Homage to glorious Kala Chakra. Unruly beings always see the form of the divine Lord sprung from merit and knowledge as a fearsome Bhairava, while good people see it as free of conceit. So here is saying that uh, like an embodiment like Kalachakra, uh, a wild and savage being or unruly one sees it as frightening. They're afraid of a Buddha. But the good people, they see it as somehow normal with no, no errors, you know, they somehow see it, they, they don't fear it, which is kind of an interesting way to be in. That's really interesting. In a way, I think it's because a Buddha is not there for himself, as we've often talked about, but just to remind you why people are so moved by the Dalai Lama, because in a way the very body is not just there for his own sake. Although he would deny that if he heard me say that in front of him, he would go, oh, give me a break type of thing. But, but that is the case of such a high incarnation, I believe. I have that faith. So therefore there's a feel, and therefore when he meets someone, he's sort of really present with that someone. In a way, he's seeing the situation almost automatically from the other one's point of view. And so the other one feels like very close to such a person. And they, they, they don't feel a kind of resistance to their presence that we ordinary self-centered beings sort of have to each other subliminally, why we shake hands to show we don't have a weapon in the hand, why we give hugs. We're sort of right, we're trying to get out of that thing of being an opposed being who's there for itself. Getting, I'm getting the, my batch of the air here and you're getting yours. But a Buddha's not like that, although they might show the form of a being that breathes, they're really there for you. So I often say, like, if, you, if a mad scientist put two beings in a, in a time lock safe room with, no, with, a, with a time lock on the lock that there's only enough oxygen for one of them to survive, only a Buddha would be able to freely cease to breathe and consume oxygen. So the other one could survive without any effort or displeasure or freak out. A Buddha could do that by definition. An ordinary person couldn't they'd try. They, the, so the, the altruistic person might try holding their breath, but they'd get to a level then of having sort of spasms where their body would, autonomic nervous system, would grab air. And uh, But a Buddha doesn't have such a, is not driven by any kind of unconscious impulse, an enlightened being. So that's, that's the difference. And that's why Kapundarika seeks that. And he's saying to you at the beginning of Sadhana chapter, he's saying that. You need a body like that. And he also mentions sprung from merit and knowledge because in practicing a sadhana, you are developing merit, punya, and you're developing jnana. He, she puts knowledge, I would call it intuition, intuitive knowledge, you know, deep, deep kind of knowledge, you know, immediate knowledge, not uh, conceptual knowledge. 
but um, but in a way ordinary that, that is ordinary knowledge is like that underneath the conception so knowledge is okay so those are the two stores that anybody collects even if they're not doing tantric sadhana and it takes three incalculable aeons of lifetimes for a bodhisattva without esoteric practice and you by doing sadhana and creation stage after initiation you get going into you're going off meat space whether you know it or not when you enter into an attempt to visualize the mandala you're leaving meat space and you're going into not i guess we don't say cyberspace but you're going into mandala space and and in a way your ability to visualize and imagine this is really interesting i think this point it gives you a different encouragement in doing it your ability to imagine and visualize it's not like you're creating it therefore it's like you're finding it because it's there you know it's given to everyone the kalachakra mandala is everywhere it's the it's the blissed out level of perceiving everything no with no flaw no fault no pain you know all as made of bliss it's clear light level and so what you're visualizing is actually your way of opening your mind to that perception using the concept to reach a conceptless experience of it which you don't do until you get more versatile at it so you know we have trouble visualizing we say oh it's so terrible hard to visualize and it is because we are regularly visualizing you know ordinary things to to recognize them you know to slap our concept on them so we are sort of our brain constructs the perception out of molecules you know photons light that comes reflected although you know seeming instantaneous because it's speed of light and yet you know light that is not or it must be less than speed of light because if it was speed of light it would be everywhere you know we couldn't see it then it would be we'd just be lost in a flow of light because it all is light and in that all that light the buddha mandalas are being maintained by the buddhas all the time and when they embrace us as their beloved disciple and because we are so open to receiving to being reborn through that initiation ceremony as we will go through someday again more in depth then uh, we uh, so when we visualize we're recovering what actually is there at the extraordinary level the magical illusory magical level and and uh, therefore the stronger we get about it the more the, the 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 learning more of emptiness so i'm so glad you all did that on the last call the learning more about emptiness is what makes us realize the illusoriness of what we think we are perceiving as the solid world and the more we realize the illusoriness of that then the, then within illusion we can paint with the brushes of samadhi as ketub says in his in his uh beautiful sadhana long sadhana book or mind mandala sadhana books that we have read in previous sessions um uh we are painting within those illusions we're shifting you know that's why it, it's so fast and then the merit and the knowledge accumulation so all the offerings that you visualize in the sadhana practice and um and all being you know appreciating of the beauty of the buddha body and the kala chakra body and the building the mandala building and its jewel-like ornamentation and so forth and all of that is developing merit and our and our awareness of the illusoriness and the and the voidness of everything we see in our visualization is deepening our intuitive knowledge and so both are being and those those deepenings are accelerating what we would normally take many many lifetimes to to gain of course this is especially in the perfection stage where we simulate a, a death and rebirth process death between and rebirth process but even in the creation stage we do that by going into the between of this of the side and the session we enter a between through imagination it's just beautiful it's just so cool <laughs> okay so unruly beings always see the form of the divine lord the bhagavan sprung from merit and knowledge as a fearsome bhairava that's bhairava means terrifier or i like to say terrific and i think i'll stick with it actually some people try to dissuade me terrific in its real meaning while good people see it as free of conceit 
that is to say, not higher, not holier than thou, like like our mother, our lover, our friend, our, our beloved, our brother or sister, you know, which is how the Lama always addresses everyone, sisters and brothers and sisters. Homage to him, second verse, homage to him whose speech reaching others' hearing and endowed with all languages points out the true path in accord with the mental dispositions of sentient beings. So here, he, she, he's praising the speech of Buddha, Bhagavan, whether in his Kalachakra form or not, it applies to any manifestation of Buddha. And the speech, of course, is the, I know Dzongkhapa has a famous verse in his short essence of good eloquence, where he says, of all the deeds of a Buddha, the deeds of speech are supreme. Therefore, wise people praise Buddha from the point of view of their speech. And Zeba Kunle Sungini, Zeba Choyin Deyani, Dedekeva Sungne, I forgot to give it, I'm sorry, I remember the first line. Anyway, so here the idea is that since a Buddha experiences themselves, as being all the other beings to whom they are speaking at the same time as they are being the being that is the channel of speech, of Buddha speech. They therefore are completely aware of the linguistic receptivities of all of the beings, and they have this special ability or endowment that different beings will hear the Buddha in their own language. It's like the Star Trek translator computer, you know, that the automatic translator that also happens between people who meet aliens and they automatically hear the alien in English, the alien hears them in the alien language without any effort. So the Buddha is like that. It's amazing how many things in these sci-fi films are anticipating things that are already in the Buddhist idea of what a being can become. So reaching others hearing, endowed with all languages, points out the true path, I guess reaching, she puts an and there, and I guess meaning that, you know, without, in the days when they didn't have, you know, audio file magnification, amplification, that a Buddha had a special language ability to appear, to be seem to be right in front of anybody in a vast audience of a hundred thousand beings. They say, you know, there are these huge assemblies, which of course Westerners take as just, you know, pious exaggeration, but I'm sure, quite sure they're true. And uh, so he, everyone felt he was just right close by them. Uh, that's part of it. So he, you know, immediate in others' hearing and endowed with all languages, points out the true path in accord with the mental dispositions of beings and or knows everybody's mental disposition and therefore shows the one, each one the path that is correct for that one, which will be different from different ones. That's wonderful. And now, his body that is endowed with the third verse, his body that is endowed with the best of all forms and is perceived by sentient beings in accordance with their dispositions and their respective mental states has the characteristics of an emanation body, a nirmanakaya. So that's, that's just a defining an emanation body, a nirmanakaya, magical emanation. And he said, magical emanation of what? Because there is no one located body that is the Buddha, and then the others are just like dummies or projections, you know, magical projections. The Buddha is all of the, equally all of those projections because a Buddha is equally all of the things he's not projecting, which are just other beings. Because a Buddha's reality body, Dharmakaya, in its highest meaning of reality itself, or Dharma's hi highest meaning, of the good reality, real reality, which means clear light of the void. And so th that body is everything. And so a Buddha is a being who feels their body is everything in all of its specifics. And so therefore, out of the various energy, the infinite energy that is at the base, like the energy that creates or that manifests and sustains any particular being in any particular environment, there's always infinite amount of extra energy there for a Buddha. So out of the energy around that being, a Buddha can shape whatever it is that exactly interacts with that being. 
to benefit that being in the optimal possible way. That's called nirmana chaya, body of emanation. And in a way, uh, near mana, mana means to magically create, and near means going out of. So it's the same, the same idea of it's going out of a source. But the source is not like one person is a one body hiding somewhere and being the Buddha, and then the rest are just, just creations of the Buddha. No, Buddha is all of the bodies, and therefore can create infinite. But Manakaya is infinite in its ability to manifest gangla gandul de la detamba, as they say. That whatever it is that educates whomsoever, he manifests that, or she, or it manifests that, whatever a Buddha is. Okay? So that's in Nirmanakaya. Then, fourth verse His body that displays its miracles. And here, Bhutan, she, uh, Vesna gives the footnote from Bhutan, the great uh, master, grandmaster like grandfather teacher of Tsongkhapa. Uh, and it threw, I mean, he, was, he, he died of only, when Tsongkhapa was only five or six, and still in Amdo, so they never met. I uh, died, I think, in six years after Tsongkhapa was born. And so Tsongkhapa studied with Chung Bo Lela, his great student, and master of the Guya Samaja and Yamandaka and this kind of thing, called Chakra. And, uh, but Bhutan says that the miracle that, that is meant here, even though it's in a plural, it's mainly the miracle of teaching. That's the true miracle of Buddha. Manifesting bodies, visions, uh, doing things that can contravene the normal laws of gravity and things like that. Those are, not, those are minor miracles. The great miracle is teaching, uh, because teaching is what then opens the recipient of the teaching, the student, to the reality that is so glorious, that is their own reality, actually. It's not some other reality that they have to give themselves up and go find, go become something else. It isn't that. It's the glory of their own reality. Because every being is actually made of glory, made of clear light of the void, that's it. And the world is made of glory. That's what it is, according to, according to Buddhist physics. So his body that displays its miracles through the utterances of all sentient beings in accord with the dispositions of sentient beings, is characterized as enjoyment body, sambhogakaya. She calls it enjoyment body. I call it beatific body. I think enjoyment is not strong enough for me. Boga by itself could mean enjoyment. But samboga, sam means total. So therefore I want a stronger word like bliss or beatitude, you know. We have from Dante and from Latin, you know, we have the idea, and the Catholic Church maintains the word beatific. And it's a, beatif a person is beatific when they are filled with bliss, I think. That's better. But, it, but it, that's the preferred enjoyment, and that's, that's, that's standard amongst people. Because they, it keeps it safe. It's not too much enjoyment. <laughs> it might be dangerous. So anyway, it displays its miracle. And he says, through the utterances of all sentient beings, and I'm not sure about this. Here, are they saying that said the Buddha universe somehow gives speech to beings, you know, like manifest as speech from a very subtle plane, because it's through speech that beings can reach beyond themselves and connect to others by listening and speaking. And is that somehow a gift of Buddha? At the subtle plane level, because Sambhogakaya is Sambhogakaya is infinite and etern and and perpetual, like the Dharmakaya, like the reality body. It's the it's the individual Buddha's enjoyment of the reality body. So it's sort of like just vast light. It's the light in the reality of everything, or something like that. It's, it, in a way, it's this, of course it's this differentiation between the individual being who has become a Buddha and drawing being one with all the Buddhas in the vast infinite reality body that includes everything. These are all dualistic kind of ideas in terms of language, which is dualistic, but automatically, they're really said to be one thing. So the individual universal duality is collapsed in that. And yet this is showing that that each Buddha gets to enjoy being one, the same as all the Buddhas. Something like, something inconceivable like that. You know, contradict, seemingly contradictory like that. And so, does that, is that what, what inspires speech? 
you know, the whole thing, you know, the, the evolutionists are looking at the chimpanzee and this and that, 98% of the same genes, and then where's the, where's the gap where suddenly the brain is big and they're able to speak? And uh, because, well, chimps speak, rah, 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 they make sound, but speak in words, you know, where does that come from? Is this saying that? I'm not sure. Or is this, an, uh, you know, the translation would make it seem like that. And I don't have the Sanskrit with me. So it could be meaning something very magical like that. Or it could simply mean that he's, he gives his teachings by, in every language. Which uh, is the vow of some, the Bodhisattva Samantha Bhadra, or the Buddha's oh, universally good Buddha, Samantha Bhadra, that he will give, teach the Dharma in every language. Learn every language to teach it. But where automatically is every language, then he can, it automatically gets taught or something. Maybe. I don't know. I'm not sure about that. So, But anyway, through the utterances of all sentient beings, of course, in accordance with their dispositions, each one's dispositions, that's like the similar, we already had that idea. So that's his Sambhogakaya. And that, that's interesting. So Sambhogakaya gets con related to speech among body, speech, and mind. It's sort of subtle, like speech. And um, it reminds me a little bit of the goddess in the Vimalakirti in the chapter where she teases uh, Shariputra for thinking he can't say anything about nirvana because, because speech is too dualistic to express nirvana. And she says, do not point to nirvana by abandoning speech. The nirvana is neither outside nor inside nor anywhere in between. Neither is speech outside or inside or anywhere in between. The very nature of speech is nirvana, she says. So the very, is the very nature of speech the beatific body of the Buddha? Is that is it in the vast ocean of speech of all articulate beings throughout the universe in the many humanoid planets that exist, the infinite numbers of humanoid planets that exist in the infinite universe? I don't know if that's the claim that's being made. It's a very sci-fi claim. But the Mahayana is very sci-fi. Buddha, the Buddha view of the world is very sci-fi. Or you could say that the Western, the modern tradition of sci-fi is a teaching of visualization to we humans to visualize the worlds that could be, the society that could be, either both bad and good, bad as a cautionary and good as inspirational. You could say that. So sci-fi is a sadhana for the society as a whole. Very interesting. For example, you know, Star Trek, the Klingons were the Russians. Then they kind of petered out the Romulans were the Chinese, but 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 uh, old, but Star Trek kind of like lost track there. And we had the new series in a different universe and all that, so it didn't stay so close to the U.S. political situation. But the long-term Cold War Star Trek, the Klingons were totally the Russians, and so eventually bringing Worf on board was like citizen diplomacy with the Russians in the subliminal mind of the American people. <laughs> Wouldn't you say? But we had to think of its effect on the subliminal mind of Trump, of course. Never mind. Uh, never mind. That's a joke. Okay. His body, then we could, then the fifth verse. That's amazing. And, oh, yeah. And so, beatific body, the bardo, speech, dream, all of uh, the illusion body, all of these three, all of these are kind of interconnected. You know? Like, like the reality body is connected with death, deep sleep, uh, you know, the death point, the deep sleep state, uh, one point in samadhi state, you know. Uh, and, um, and the waking state is, is connected with the, right, with the uh, ordinary existence and uh, nirmanakaya, body of emanation, and... Um, and uh, uh, etc. Nirmanakai. His body that is, uh, fifth verse, his body that is neither impermanent nor permanent, neither single nor characterized as many, neither an existing thing nor a non existing phenomenon, is the Dharma body, which is without basis, meaning not founded on anything, because it is everything. So the Dharma body, this is the Dharmakaya, the I call it reality body, 
she takes it out of saying using the Sanskrit word. Remember, I think I've told you that the word dharma has 11 meanings all the way from a thing. It can mean a simple thing. It can mean a property of an object also. It can mean a topic of discussion at the lowest meaning of what are the bottom range of five or six meanings are what are called pattern maintaining meanings, where it can mean also duty, law and religion, all kinds of structural things that, that make hold patterns, you know, because it comes from the word dirt to hold. And those are the old pre-Buddhist meanings, pretty much, in Indian literature, dharma. But then Buddha gives it a, another range of five or six meanings that are what, what are you could call pattern transcending meanings, where the holding means that reality holds us in freedom from suffering, rather than holds us in a fixed pattern of behavior like law, duty, custom, religion, you know. Do you, it's your dharma, you know, they, it's what they tell Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita. That's the old Brahminical structural meaning. But dharma means path, where you leave something, you know, go on a path. Teaching, where you change your mind, you change your being by learning something. Uh, truth, which makes you free. And finally, reality itself. Um, and texts, you know, that embody that teaching and so forth, are all set of meanings where they are liberating meanings, you know, rather than than, uh, you know, resi residing meanings or transcending meanings, right? So the highest one, Dharma, there means reality itself because Nirvana is reality itself. That's the point. Buddhahood, Nirvana, which is only full Buddhahood, is only real Nirvana, is everything. Dharmakaya, therefore, you experience yourself as that everything. And it's everything as purely made of bliss. So it's no different from pure, sheer bliss, sheer infinite field of glory or bliss or clear light of the void or whatever you want to call it. That's what reality body is. So he, so, so it's, which is beyond dualism and conceptualization. And he, so he said, it's neither impermanent nor permanent. It's usually really permanent, actually, thought to be. But in a way, he's saying... That means it's not impermanent. But by saying that it's not permanent means that it contains all impermanence in a sense. So it is all of this, non-dual from all of the impermanent things. So therefore the duality of impermanent and permanent, in other words, when it's everything, although it's always been the case and always will be the reality body of the Buddha, it nevertheless is, in, in, in that sense, the, the meaning permanent has no meaning when there's no impermanent. And therefore, it is all the impermanent things. It's like emptiness is not a space within which things are, like space. It is the things themselves in their relativity. 